the next uh, company is Multex, and Multex uh, have, have two slots because uh, Multex are developing two reactors, one in the UK, one in Canada. Um, and so first, uh, I'd like to very much welcome Ian Scott, uh, who's going to talk about the Multex Flex reactor being developed in the UK. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation here, John. Um, just to expand on the point you made in the introduction there, the, uh, it is in some ways perhaps a little odd that Maltex is presenting here twice. Uh, for a startup company to try to develop one reactor is, uh, is ambitious. Some might say trying to do two reactors is insane, uh, but we're not. So the core technology which Maltex was established is used in both of our companies, but in very different ways. So Maltex Canada uh, is operating a, or developing a fast spectrum reactor. Uh, Maltex Flex is developing a thermal spectrum reactor. Whereas they have a, a, a similar core technology, uh, they differ in pretty much every way from there. And so we have split these out as separate companies so that each company can remain 100% focused on its own mission. And we feel that's very strong. These companies have their separate management, they have their separate boards of directors. They are not run from the center. They are very highly autonomous. And that is uh, very intentional. So talking about Maltex Flex. Flexibility and nuclear are not two things that usually go very closely together. Um, but the world is changing the way the flexibility uh, of energy generation is becoming really critical. Uh, the spread of renewables, which are almost intermittent, means two things. First, you have times when you produce relatively little energy from the renewables. So you have an energy gap that needs to be filled when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing. But secondly, the old paradigm of nuclear of operating in the base load generation mode, where it produces 24 hours, seven days a week, no longer really works because there are times when renewables will be producing all the energy that is required. And at that point, you have a choice. You either shut down your nuclear reactor, and doing that with a PWR is not simple and definitely not economical, or you shut down your renewables, which is easier to do, but again, is really very costly in terms of you are not getting any free energy. So the idea of basal generation is really going away. Multix Flex is very much targeting that evolution of the uh, energy picture with flexibility. And this slide shows really the three key elements of flexibility we're bringing to the nuclear market. First one is not new. It is that by using uh, modular size reactors, you can vary your size of power plants pretty much at will. That gives you ability to address a much larger range of markets than, for example, to give a ludicrous example, the uh, the EPR reactor, which is so big that very few grids could actually uh, support it. The other two flexibility factors, uh, which are important, is first, <clears throat> because this reactor operates at high temperature, it can use thermal energy storage, which again is not new. It's been used in the solar power industry for many years. It is an extremely cost-effective way of storing energy. Storing electricity is expensive, very expensive. Storing heat is actually really very cheap. So by using thermal energy storage, it allows us to have a reactor which can operate, uh, can output, operate 24 hours, seven days a week, but output its energy for perhaps only eight hours a day, but at three times reactor power. Economically, that's of enormous importance. And the third source of flexibility is that this reactor, which I will describe in the next slide, um, entirely passively goes from full power down to what we call idle mode of about half a percent uh, of its full power with no operator act action at all. So it is an intrinsically flexible reactor. Uh, that is not something you would ever dare do with a solid fueled reactor because the iodine problem would cause you very severe problems. Okay. Maltex operates on, it has a really core technology, molten salt, which means that the Maltex molten salt reactors are really different to all the other designs that are being pursued in the world. 
what I call conventional molten salt reactors are based on the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab molten salt reactor experiment. And the paradigm is that you have a, uh, a circulating system where the coolant is also the fuel. The fuel is pumped into reaction chamber where it goes critical, gets hot, and then pumped into heat exchanger where it gives up the heat to do something useful. That means that your reactive fuel, extremely radioactive, chemically complex and evolving, uh, is exposed to quite a number of mechanical systems, all of which have to be resistant to those conditions, and really none of which can be uh, easily maintained or replaced or repaired because of the extremely high radioactivity. The Maltex approach is different. We put molten salt fuel in tubes, pretty much like in most current conventional reactors. Instead of uranium oxide, we put molten salt in the tubes. That keeps the fuel isolated in tubes without any moving parts present at all. Heat circulates within the tube by natural convection. And it's taken away from the core by a second non-radioactive molten salt, which takes it to a heat exchanger to do useful work. That is the core technology. It is radically simpler than the pumped systems. So the Multex Flex uh, embodiment of that basic principle is shown on this slide. It is a relatively small reactor, 40 megawatts thermal, 60, 16 megawatts electric. Uh, it is a pit reactor where the core is uh, below ground level. It's graphite moderated. But it has a number of very novel uh, factors that give it its uh, particular flexibility of operation. The first is the coolant salt. Uh, we use this coolant salt, a salt that's never been used in the molten salt literature at all, extraordinarily enough. Uh, we have a patent on this. It's uh, basically cryolite from the aluminium smelting industry, an aluminium fluoride, sodium fluoride mixture, high melting point, which means the reactor has to operate at high temperature, and it does. We're looking at about a 770, 790 degrees centigrade output temperature. Um, but it's an extraordinarily good coolant. It has brilliant thermophysical properties, very high heat capacity, uh, is neutronically very attractive. It's, a, it's an excellent coolant, a joy to work with as a chemist. Uh, the fuel salt is uh, a mixture of uranium fluoride and sodium fluoride. Again, we avoid lithium, beryllium, and equally unpleasant uh, materials uh, by operating at a higher temperature, enabled by the high temperature of the reactor. The heat movement within the reactor is entirely by natural convection. So we have natural convection of the fuel salt in the tubes. We have natural convection of the coolant salt between the core and the heat exchanger as you can see from the diagram, is above ground level, and therefore relatively easily maintained. Residual cooling of the reactor, should you not take heat away to your turbines, is simply by air cooling of the tank. The reactor is small enough that, that is practical. And it is fueled for 16 years of full power operation on a single fuel load, um, with no operator action required over that period of time. Uh, other than basically monitoring. We don't want to leave something totally unattended. The final important innovation, which again plays to the lack of uh, need for active operator uh, uh, control, are what we call gadolinium salt thermometers. These are essentially like uh, old fashioned mercury thermometers. You have a bulb and a stem. The bulb and stem are bulb is full of a molten salt of gadolinium, when it expands, it goes up the stem and reduces the reactivity of the core. This is also not an entirely original idea. These have been suggested for fast reactors using molten lithium as the liquid. Uh, that's never been actually put into practice, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the advantage of the gadolinium salt is twofold. One is it is much more chemically stable than molten lithium. The second is it doesn't produce tritium in large quantities, which uh, lithium inevitably does. And therefore, you have a much smaller uh, radioactivity problem to deal with. Um, we talked a little bit about corrosion in previous talks. So I'd just like to say a word about this. 
Uh, corrosion has been very much misunderstood. Definitely outside the molten salt react community, but to a degree also inside it. Um, the essence of managing corrosion is to get the chemistry of your salts right. That is the key. The way that, that uh, Oak Ridge National Lab went about it was to devise new alloys which would corrode slower than conventional stainless steels. That is not, in my view, the way to go forward. The way to go forward is to arrange it so that your molten salt is actually not corrosive. We've put quite a lot of work into this because the community out there is very skeptical about corrosion molten salts, so data is important. We've now run samples uh, using our molten salt stabilization technology at 900 degrees centigrade for up to a year with essentially no detectable corrosion at all. It really does work. You just have to get the chemistry of the salts right. And uh, I'm very happy to talk to anybody in the Mosul area who wants to do that because it's an issue for everybody and there's no reason we shouldn't solve it uh, together. And at that point, I will stop, give you back a little bit of time, John, I hope. Yes, Ian. Yes, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, and thank you for insisting on the corrosion area in particular. Um, uh, any questions for Ian on the Multex Flex reactor? Of, uh, Jacques Rueur. Yeah. Jacques Rueur, what's your question? Is your microphone on? Maybe we can take a... Uh, we have a second question of someone uh, in Hebrew language, so we cannot read the name. <laughs> My name is Kobe Adulami. Thank you. So your question was, uh, yeah, what's your emergency planning zone around a 16 megawatt electric system, Ian? Yeah. It will be small. Uh, I think you cannot actually answer that question until you have a fully detailed design that has gone through a regulatory process. The planning zone will be a subject to negotiation. But in principle, very small, because for all the reasons which have been mentioned by other presenters, the 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 mechanism for release of substantial radioactive material in most most not all molten salt reactors just isn't there and so small emergency planning zones are needed my suspicion is that the limiting factor on the exclusion zone or control zone around the reactor will actually be uh, sky shine from gamma radiation something which people tend not to talk about or consider but it's a, a very uh very important factor there are a lot of hard gamma rays come out of any fission reactor and so uh i suspect that it won't be release of radioactivity it will be gamma ray radiation that actually controls the restricted zone okay thanks nicola brayton has asked uh, why only 16 megawatts electric why why so small it's a very good question so part of the trade-off in order to get a reactor which will entirely operate by natural convection is you cannot achieve a very high power density. If you want a high power density core, you've got to pump coolant through it very fast. And that's a, 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 that's a, uh, a paradigm which has been used extensively, including by Maltex. The aim here was to get something which would actually operate entirely passively. That means you require a relatively low power density and that means that unless you can have an extremely physically large reactor, it needs to be small. Somewhat to our surprise, that size turns out to be something of an economic sweet spot uh, in terms of uh, manufacturability and overall cost. 